Okay, so uh, 345, uh, let's call the meeting to order. I will uh, start off with everybody's most favorite part, the uh, one entertaining attempt to read this checklist without making a mistake. So let's see how this goes. So here's a checklist, a checklist to ensure meetings are compliant with the right to know law during the state of emergency. As chair of the Sanborn Regional School Board's Finance Subcommittee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we are A, providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possibilities by video or other electronic means. We are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the Sanborn Regional School Board's Finance Subcommittee have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in the meeting through dialing the following phone number, 1-646-558-8656. Meeting ID is 924-8576-2759, or by clicking on the following website address on YouTube, which is YouTube, www.youtube.com slash C slash SRSD meeting videos. B, providing public notice of necessary information for accessing the meeting. We previously gave notice to the public of the necessity of the necessary information for assessing the meeting, including how to access the meeting using Zoom or telephonically. Instructions have also been provided on the website of the Sanborn Regional School District at www.sau17.net. C, providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anybody has a problem, please call 978-482-7394 or email at helpdesk at sau17.net. D, adjourning the meeting. If the public is unable to access the meeting, in the event the public is, able, is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting will be done by a roll call vote. Let's start the meeting taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also ask whether there's anyone in the room with them during the meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Only a few stumbles. Uh, so I'll go by uh, the people on the screen as I see them. Uh, Don? I'm Dutton. I am at home and there is no one with me. Matt? I'm Matt Angel. I'm at the SAU office and there's no one here. Tom? Tom Ambrose, superintendent. I'm on my back deck and no one else is here. Jim? Jim Baker. I'm at home and there's no one here in the room. Uh, and Gordon, I'll call on you because Matt was just saying that maybe you're going to stay for some of it. So if you could uh, answer that, please. Sure. Gordon Parks. I am in my uh, home office alone. And Jamie Fitzpatrick, I'm in my home office alone. Um, so I think that covers everyone. And let me grab the agenda here. So the first item on the agenda is a review of the minutes. Uh, could I get a motion on the minutes, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, so that was Jim Baker. <laughs> so uh, moved and and um, and Don seconded. Any discussions? I don't have any. Okay, let's move the vote. So um, if I could get a roll call, Don? Yes. Jim? Yes. Myself, I. So uh, the minutes are approved. Uh, revolving fund balance. So the balance is as of April. We have seen that balance fund. Matt does not have that data set yet because the month just barely ended. Uh, so unless there's a, a, a need to look at that data again, I would suggest that we can skip over that because that is not for a May month-end data set. Everybody okay with that? I am. Okay. Um, expenditure reports. Uh, Matt, would you do the honor, since you seem to do it better than I, of share, sharing the expenditure reports for us? All right. Do you want to do a screen share? 
Yeah, please. Okay. And... Is that it? I'm not doing a good job at it right now. Ah, uh, misery loves company. Good deal. Yes, that's right. And screen two, share. All right. You guys see a lot on this. Oh, wow. You got a lot of stuff up there, man. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so basically, uh, we have this is for just health insurance. And through the end of May, we've spent uh, $3.8 million for health insurance. We have $725,000 remaining. This would be really for the month of June. And uh, what's unspent for the remainder of the year is $379,154. Um, and let me see if I can switch to, let me see if I can bring up the other one without changing my screen. So while you're bringing that one up, Matt, this this is roughly a $25,000 shift in our health fund. I believe that uh, April uh, month end was 404,000 remaining. This is now 370 or 379,000 remaining. So shift of mm -hmm. 5,000. Uh, do you happen to know what is the cause of that shift? I do not. And I think what it's going to be is going to be some changes in people's health insurance. Because really, there was no other um, um, uh, change in that line item other than people coming and going. All right. How how does that work uh, for the district's plan? The, the plans I'm familiar with, you have one one sign up time where you can change per year, and or you have to demonstrate a life change. What is how does our process work on that? It's the same. So we sign up um, right now. We're doing open enrollment for July 1st. And during the year, if someone were to leave or or if they have a life change, like uh, say they had children, um, then then they would be brought on to the uh, plan. Um, and what the the way that the budget is built, it's built based upon what the uh, what the the cost is for the actual cost for last year plus 10 percent. OK. And then, um, and then we try to encumber what we actually think is going to happen during the year. And then um, as, as the year progresses, we liquidate a portion of that encumbrance and then record the actual expenditure as it occurs. So if I'm understanding, then there's probably some instances of um, children being picked up or spouses being picked up that weren't primarily, that weren't there previously that would have impacted a May number, if, if I'm understanding what you're saying, correct? That's correct. Okay. So, a uh, question, Jamie? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't see faces, so. Yeah. Um, yes. So on the encumbered amount, encumbered amount, is that also an estimate or does is that known that that's an actual all of, all of that amount is expense is expense for sure. Um, it's an it's an estimate based upon our our um, uh, best guess last um, summer. Okay. So that by the end of the of the end of this month, that could be different then, right? Yeah, it could be slightly different. Okay. I don't expect it to be much different. Okay. So can I can I just say? Uh, uh, Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, thanks. It's important to remember that. Um, if people resign over the summer and the people we hire have a different insurance, either up or down, that's the, the just the, the organic volatility of insurance. It's not a large percentage that we usually have change over the summer, but even if it's finalized at the end of June, it can still change in July and August. But, but that, it doesn't change. But it doesn't change for the 2019-20 year. At that point, it's changing for the 2021 year. Yeah. I just was, wanted the public to understand that it's never really fixed when we're in the hiring season. Yep. Other questions or can we move on to the expenditures at this point? The uh, non-health expenditures. I'm all set. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you see uh, the non-health non expenditures on the screen? Yes, I can. Okay, so 
Um, as of the end of May, we've spent uh, 24 million 175 thousand towards non-health insurance expenditures. This includes uh, personnel costs such as uh, salaries, health, and benefits, uh, except for health insurance, and and um, supplies, materials, utility costs, and and debt service. Okay, remaining what we have encumbered. I'm sorry, is uh, 4.6 million dollars. What has been um, obligated but has not yet been um, spent, and there is a change um, compared to the prior months because I have put in the purchase order for a phone system for Chromebooks, which should be included in this. And then what's remaining is one point two million dollars. I thought the Chromebooks was going to come out of the facilities revolving fund. Is that what got voted? I believe it is. Yes. Okay, then I need to make a change there. I will I will go and revisit that one. Okay, just make a note of that. Yeah, thank you. And then the the um, the memorial roof would not have been in there either, right? Because that would have been coming out of the revolving fund too. That's correct. What in the um, the two hundred ten thousand for the um, North Point would that would that be the main the main part of the reduction? Uh, I don't believe I've done the purchase order for that. I'd have to double check. I can't recall at this moment. So, um, so Jim, just so that you know, I was here on on site until four in the morning, so I had three hours of sleep. Yeah, so Matt's not going to be his usual ninja self today, guys. Yeah, okay. I, I talked to Matt about that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so why, why don't we just on, on that one, Matt, if you don't mind, just some type of a, a reconciliation for the next meeting. Hey, these are the big play. I mean, I, I don't need every Nats behind yeah. as to uh, what I, was have to get a I bought a new pack of, uh, of uh, yeah. writing paper, but the big the big ticket items that made the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm trying. I'm sending off an email right now to fix it. And then I think the last item that we have would be for the revenues. And let me see if I can bring those up. Now, um, we did an analysis of the tuition um, and found out that there was a mistake in the revenue budget, which has since fixed that. So let me see if I can share this. share okay so so basically what the problem with the the revenue budget for the tuition is that some um uh, adequacy funds were included in that okay which which made it a surplus of 109 i'm sorry an, an under funding amount of one hundred ninety four thousand dollars. so in reality um we've received $49,000 worth of tuition. This would be um, individual tuition and also um, uh, preschool. Uh, let's see, we have, uh, we still haven't billed the, uh, the Fremont tuition and we're working on that right now to make the final amount for Fremont. Um, and then what you'll notice down here for adequate ed, it broken up to two pieces. You have the 21,905 as a shortfall here, but if you look down further, the kindergarten age has been broken out. So um, I think next year, what we're gonna do is we're gonna collapse these two lines together because the state makes that adequate ed payment as one big giant number, as opposed to trying to show it in detail. And then of course, the use of fund balance is really just budgeting for net income loss. So right now it shows that we need to, um, raise another $1.7 million worth of revenue, but um, a million 13 is not gonna actually be raised. Uh, let's see, and that's so, so that means that we have to, just to make the budget balance or the revenue budget balance, we have to raise $724,871 um, just to make it a flat revenue. Now, if we're gonna probably bill about a million dollars to the town, uh, to Fremont School District, so we're gonna actually be over our revenue budget. Um, let's put in a million dollars um, by 275,000. Good. Jamie? 
Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Matt, when does that Fremont tuition, when does that do? It's due about right now. Okay. Yeah, and so basically it's a process to make that, uh, that bill happen. And with the COVID-19, um, trying to collect all the attendance data is, is much more difficult. So we're usually a couple of days behind in, in actually pulling together the attendance data and it takes a couple of days to actually put it into the bill and calculate it. But this will be collected um, before our next board meeting? Uh, it's probably going to be collected at the beginning of June. So what we're going to do is we're going to record it as- Well, it's the beginning of June now. I'm sorry, beginning of July. Yeah, that's what I thought you meant. Okay. So are you going to consider it collected then, or how do we do that? What we do is we record a receivable, okay? And we consider that 100% of that receivable is going to be collectible. Okay. Okay. And so, uh, um, and we'll just, in July. Okay. Any further questions there, Jim? Nope. Don? Nope. Okay, let's move on to uh, the year-end spending uh, projects, uh, starting with the financial accounting system, because we really want to get a recommendation out on that um, at this meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I have no updates on that, except that we're all excited to get that um, started. Um, do you have any questions on that? Yeah, I mean, well, I'll let Jim and Don go first. Um, I just think when you when you talk about it at the school board meeting, you need to make sure that you say that the recurring charges are a savings over what we're paying now. Okay. Um, and also point out that I think the the paperwork that went out mentions the uh, the payback period, eleven point six years. Um, and Jamie, himself, Jamie, who had calculated that, said that that really wasn't needed for this type of a, an investment. I don't know that that needs to be part of it. I can actually bring it up on the screen if everyone wants. It's um, not like we're buying light bulbs for energy right, efficiency right. or, you know. Right. Yeah. So why don't I just do a quick overview on it just for the public. And... I believe it is this one. So just so that you know, on the screen share, it's just a small icon. So just a, yes, yeah, so, all right. So um, I did a, a write-up for the school board um, regarding the, uh, the financial system. And basically what I'm saying is, is that, uh, that to, to bring over uh, the system, uh, update it to the current, most recent current system, all we have to do is buy a couple of modules and then pay for the implementation cost. Uh, normally, if we had to go outside the uh, outside of the system, it would cost about three hundred thousand dollars to replace the system. Uh, currently, we pay about forty-two thousand dollars in annual fees for our time and attendance system. Um, so the one-time cost really is broken down into two pieces. It's eighty-six thousand for one-time cost, seventeen thousand for um, license fees which would be the new modules, and then implementation cost of $58,980. Implementation cost includes data conversion from one system to another, project management from uh, Tyler Technologies, and then training for the, the new software. Reincurring costs are broken down into two pieces, annual maintenance of uh, $2,864, and a hosting and an annual hosting fee of uh, Oop, that math is wrong. It's going to be about $7,000 for annual hosting fee. And so basically an annual hosting fee is, is instead of the software residing on the server here at the school district, it resides on a server that's, um, that's hosted by Tyler Technologies in Maine. Um, now, what I, I broke out, I gave a, 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 a tax rate impact if we ran this through the general fund appropriation. Uh, it would end up being, uh, it would equate to about six cents for the town of Kingston uh, and eight cents for the town of Newton. However, if we use the facility use revolving fund, there would be no ta um, impact to the tax rate because the revenues generated in this um, revolving fund are generated through building rentals. 
Um, on the next page here is that, that cost breakout that Jim spoke about before, um, where it's the, the simple payback because the, the cost for the annual maintenance is less than uh, for the new system than our current system. So we'd be saving $6,585 a year and the payback would be just over 11 years. Question? Yeah, Jim. Um, Matt, what's the difference between the 76303 and the one above that was 86676? Page above. It looks like the same numbers, it's just added differently. I, uh, I think I fat fingered that one too. Oh, I think the 86 is correct. The 86 includes the recurring fees. Oh, so it the, does? Yeah, so up here, the 86 is, is I'm sorry, this should have been oh, I see. I see. total cost of $86,676 in one year. That's yeah. now to, and I'm going to scroll back down. It's broken out to 76000 for one-time costs and $10,373 for uh, recurring costs. Okay. Um, the other thing I think you should mention when you're talking about the 76,303 one-time fees, you should very clearly contrast that to the 300,000 um, if we weren't doing an evergreen option. Yeah. And maybe explain what, what an evergreen option means. For the other members, do you understand what they what he means by the evergreen options? I mean, so the public understands. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me just quickly explain that. So with uh, with the Tyler Technology products, as long as you stay with their product, they're not going to bill you for a purchase cost of a module that you you was previously bought. So if you're rolling from one system to another, they're just simply going to roll you over for for free. And that's the evergreen um, part of their their product. Okay. Yep. I'm all set. Okay. Um, just I want to uh, uh, make one point on that. Um, so the public option is not the the public access option isn't on the list. Uh, and in the last meeting, uh, we discussed. Uh, perhaps a different way of, of getting at that. I just want to uh, talk about that for a moment so that we're clear as to what it is we're looking at here. Uh, I believe in the public option, the, the, there was a cost to that piece and the suggestion was, and maybe we can just make available on a site or a link what the manifests are and some of this other information so that people can access it. And if, if it determines that the people accessing that are looking for even greater information than what that provides, uh, then we could take a look at this at some point in time in the future. But this would at least let us move forward with what it is that we know are uh, critical path items uh, and still have some greater transparency for public um, understanding of the finances or review of the financing um, at the same time. So uh, Matt, you got a question or comment on that? Yeah, just a comment. Um, so I've spoken to staff this week about um, having the financial information put out onto the district's website every single month, and also the manifest also posted to the district's website as they're produced. So okay. we're starting to work on that as an automatic process internally. And then I think the other point here that we should uh, take a look at from a finance committee in terms of the recommendation to the board would be the funding of this. And I think that Matt, on the spreadsheet that we reviewed last time, you had highlighted this as being uh, your recommendation to fund this out of the revolving fund to which the uh, uh, lease fees from the middle school would uh, go into. Uh, is that a correct statement? That's correct. So then if, if uh, uh, Jim or Don, I, any more comments on this? And if not, uh, then maybe we could have a motion to um, accept and recommend the proposal to the school board uh, with that funding. So we, I have a question. We have about 197,000 in the 
facilities revolving fund. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So there's plenty of money there to cover these different projects that we're proposing. That's correct. Okay. That's, that's my, I'm all set. Tom? I was Tom. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that don't forget that the facilities use revolving fund will now be replenished in addition to the rental of like the auditorium at the high school and other buildings, the SLC's rent will go in there as well. Right. So it's a great time to use those funds. It'll self replenish without a burden on the taxpayers. Yeah. And Don, any comments? No, I think, I think, you know, we talked about using the revolving fund last time and I think it makes sense. Okay. C could I get a motion then please? Uh, I move that we purchase the uh, Tyler tech new accounting system. Uh, using funds from the facilities revolving fund. Well, just if I might, a friendly amendment. I think we're for the amount recommending to the board because it's over. Uh, oh, right. Allowed right. To do. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, and can I get a second? Second. Okay. So uh, can we have votes? Uh, do a roll call vote. Don? Yes. Jim? Yes. And myself, I, so a unanimous vote in favor of recommending to the board the purchase of the accounting system and the funding of it via the uh, revolving use fund. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Uh, next, updated cost estimates. Do we have any updated cost estimates for Memorial or the paving in the high school? And the paving in the high school, remember the signage um, and, and the striping, et cetera. No. Okay. So, okay. So that, that is pending for the next meeting then. So yes. we'll table that and, and move forward with that for the next meeting. Um, uh, one of the questions that came up, it came up in the last, Oh, I'm sorry, Don, did you have your hand up? Yeah. I was just going to say um, when we're getting, I know we're looking to get, you know, all the um, numbers for that, but when we're looking at signage and striping, are you also going to be looking at signage and striping for the other schools as well, or just the high school? Uh, it's going to be um, for the other schools as well because it's going to be we're we're looking at the the drop off loops for Memorial um, not so much at Bakey but um, Memorial is definitely going to be a little more there's more people going there so they need a little more direction. Oh, trust me, Bakey needs really good direction too. I've done <laughs> yes, it does. No, and I agree completely. I've gone in backwards more often than I'd like to admit. So I would say if we could get some signage and maybe even paint the parking lot there, that'd be great. But if we can't do it now, we can do it. You know, right. we've got so much going on. We might need to table that temporarily, but it is awkward, isn't it, Don? It is. And where you go from two lanes to one, people get confused and they get mad because they don't realize there are two lanes yeah. and it causes frustration and you get mad parents. And <laughs> Yeah. Jim, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, the estimates on this work will be by location, not one big estimate. Is yes. that right? Okay. That's correct. Okay. Uh, the next item, funding reserve increases for the 2020 Warren articles. So this came up and we discussed it last time of uh, funding it out of uh, FY20 funds rather than FY21 funds when 19 was funded out of funds and not 19 funds. Went back and looked at the Warren article itself because I had some questions come up on that. I reread the Warren article and the Warren article is pretty specific. It will come out of unexpended funds from the June 30th and be applied on July 1st. So that is that is the actual wording of the Warren article. That is what the taxpayers said, yes, do this. And I, I think that that has to be done in that manner. And it's different than apparently the wording was previously. Wording this time around, that's clearly what it's that is clearly what it says and that that i believe is what needs to happen so any any comments uh, on jim or don on that or i can bring up if you'd like the actual wording if you want to review the wording i'm all set no i'm good great okay. good job thank okay. you so all right so then we're clear on that one that's that's where that has to be so that that makes a lot of sense uh the next item on the list is laptops um, so we had asked for an aging request uh, gordon did provide some information at the last meeting uh, and we asked for the specs. So I did see the specs. I don't know if everybody saw copies of the specs. Um, the one thing that I brought up on that, and I'd like to throw that out for discussion is, it would seem to me that the pro service fee, which is uh, a service contract for four years, 
is uh, more expensive than its value. And, and here would be my reasoning. And I, I want to throw that out for discussion. Uh, at the rate that is being quoted, uh, in order to make use of that in an effective manner, it would say that you had to have between 25 and 31% effective rate, meaning that over a four year period of time, between a quarter and a third of your purchases fail and you need to have them serviced. Um, what Gordon gave us last time was a series of um, what we had available and we had um, hundreds, a few hundred that were well over five years old. So our experience says that they don't really fail at four. And it's probably more prudent to not get that. And then when the failures occur to simply buy new ones, because you're likely to get failures at a rate of, I, I don't know, my experience has been, you get the dogs every, every uh, now and then five, 10, maybe even 15%. But at that level, um, you're half of the cost and you're only paying for it in the future dollars when the failure occurs, not in the present value dollars of today. So in my mind, it made more sense to forego that. And, and I look at that in the terms of what we do in the business world. These are great margin enhancers, service contracts. Um, you sell a service contract for a time period that is within the serviceable life of the design of the product. So car companies design their product to be not going to be breaking down up to 36,000 miles, generally speaking, on the powertrain. And then they'll sell you a service warranty, you know, to, to take it to 100,000. Um, but they know that it's going to, generally speak, not have a powertrain problem if you do the right maintenance over the 100,000. So to me, it's, it's, it's a great margin enhancer from a Dell perspective, from a uh, perspective of the, the district. I, I don't think that we're getting value for money for that service. And I'd open it up to comments of Gordon, Matt, Tom, Jim, uh, just raise your hands and let we, we can have further discussion on Let Gordon handle this one. Gordon? Hey, um, so, you know, I, I agree, Jamie, um, you know, on, on, on two parts. One, I believe the standard warranty that you get with the equipment, I believe it's one year. So we know we're covered for one year there. Um, the majority of parts in these laptops as well can be replaced after the fact at, you know, a cheaper cost. So if a, you know, a piece of memory goes bad in the laptop, we can buy a, a new chip of memory and install it ourselves, you know, and we, we have the tech support and, and the guys have the ability to be able to do something like that. So I do agree with, um, with that about the, you know, the cost over, over time and, you know, the actual failure rate. Um, typically the, the majority of the failure rate is most of the time uh, user error, you know, so somebody <laughs> drops it or smashes it. Um, I that. don't, <laughs> I don't believe that this particular uh, pro support covers everything compared to um, I think they have like a pro support plus, which would pretty much cover everything but fire and, um, and theft. Um, so there's no saying that if a laptop does break in the hands of somebody that it's even going to be covered under that, uh, pro support. Um, so with that said, I mean, it would definitely, uh, drop, I believe it was two, 279 for the four years. Yeah, so twenty-seven thousand nine hundred. Yeah, so we could definitely um, drop that out and let you know the tech department handle that aspect. And then if you know something does go beyond repair, then you know we're forced to buy at that point. But um, but I think we could handle the majority of that the repairs needed. Oh, okay, Matt, comments. Yeah, so my only comment is, is that the pro support, this is just for like the general public, the pro support is an insurance policy where we, where governments can really deal with uh, mitigating their risk in two different ways. The first one is to buy insurance policy and the second way to mitigate the risk is to, uh, is to self-fund it. So basically if we don't pay for the pro support, we're gonna be paying, we're gonna be self-funding the cost for this. Correct. And, and, that, and it sounds like, you know, we have to go through, when we do this, we have to go through a risk analysis to make sure that um, it's reasonable 
for the government to do this. And from listening to everyone here, it seems reasonable to not pay for the, the pro support and then and then incur the risk of having to replace those items. And and I would just I would just point out uh, two things, one for the public and one for Matt. So for the public, after review of the specifications last time, the actual quote is slightly lower than it was before because they reviewed what uh, was really going to be needed and they were able to, to shave some of the cost off. So thank you. For that. Um, and for the second, and this one's for Matt, we need to make sure that this is so that Matt can hang those minutes up in his office. When some mad crazed subcommittee chair says, why are we spending more money for some of these laptops? You can point and say, because that's how you wanted to manage this. Uh, that doesn't fall down the memory hole. So uh, I, I do understand to Matt's exact point. This is a self ensuring scenario. I just think it's, it's a more prudent one. But you'll, need, you'll have to replace some laptops and you'll have to pay for that. You know, that's yeah. part of the, what we're signing up for. Uh, Jim? Yeah, a question. If a, if a student does abuse a laptop or drop a laptop, um, what options do we have? Do we just have to eat that or is there something built into the program where the students share some responsibility? Gordon would like so to talk. Can I? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, so when it comes to students, the students uh, will not be carrying these types of laptops. The students have the Chromebooks. Right. Um, but in regards to your question, what I am working on currently is uh, right now with, with our current Chromebooks, if a student you know, smashes the screen, it goes up to, to Bruce, the tech at the high school, and he will either um, pull the screen off a retired Chromebook and install it and, and uh, get it back to the, the kid, or, um, or we'll buy parts like, say, batteries or, or charging ports, um, and those will get put in brand new. Um, my plan is to incorporate a price of what we pay for a part on top of the amount of time it takes Bruce to repair these things, which we've come down anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour, depending on the repair, and work out a price that basically if a student smashes their screen, this is what it's gonna cost to get repaired. And it's gonna incorporate the price of the screen and Bruce's time. So at that point, it's really no cost to us. Yes, Jim. Um, thank you, Gordon. Um, as far as the people that would be using the laptops that we're talking about now, do you have a similar program in mind for them? I haven't thought of one because most of the time it's not a, um, we don't see it often. A lot okay. of times if, if something fails, it's a, mechanical hard drive or, or something. So it hasn't um, we have been, seen it. Uh, hasn't been an issue. That okay. Yeah, I, it's I, occasional. I got Tom and then Matt. Just, just quickly, you know, professional staff, I've never worked in a school district that made a professional staff member pay if their laptop got, you know, it's usually a severe accident. Someone drops their laptop or the laptop fails. I mean, it, certainly if a staff member intentionally abused their laptop, then we would investigate that on a case by case basis. In 20 years, I've never seen. It. Just want to assure everyone that it's just, you know, adults generally. I mean, they drop them and things happen, but it's never been intentional. With knock the cup, knock the cup of coffee over on it. Right. <laughs> and I, I would like to say too, when it comes to the students and the Chromebooks, that we we did take in consideration that things can break without the student actually causing harm to the machine and and that you know we'll we'll have to forgive because we can't you know student can't handle if a motherboard dies on a laptop sure you know it's yeah. not their own fault right and, and matt you had a comment there also no um tom covered it okay good um any other comments on laptops um, um i'd like to make one more comment um sure. between the two models, so the original one that we proposed uh, last meeting um, was the model 5410. That was, I believe, $1,133. Um, the new model is a 3410, 
And I, I did a little research on, on basically the difference. It's about a uh, $223 difference um, with the pro support. So then we can minus that. And basically that, that $200 um, dollar price difference um, is a, a few different things. Uh, the laptop itself, hardware wise, is, is spot on between the two, which is the most important part. Um, the differences with the higher end laptop was a carbon fiber chassis to make it look sleeker. We really don't care about that. Um, the screen resolution was a little higher on the, on the higher price laptop. Uh, battery as well was a, a bigger battery, um, so longer lasting on a charge. Um, and then the, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity was a little newer technology compared to the the older, or not the older one, the, uh, the cheaper one. So um, I think on this one also, we want a recommendation to the school board um, and, and maybe we can get this one to also. Um, so if we can get a recommendation to the school board for the model 3410 um, without the um, pro service uh, package and going with self-assurance, uh, that's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $63,000 or so approximately. Tom? I, yep. I, I just wanted to make sure that people know that if we go with those computers, our intention is to, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought my intention was to buy more devices for adults and use the money from the CARES Act for that purpose. Did I have that right, Matt? That's correct. That we, we were going to actually use the full 110 thousand dollars from the care act and increase the number of devices at a lower cost not increase the not decrease the total purchase okay. so so what he's saying is it's worth like hundred and ten thousand dollars we'd like to increase the number of uh devices that we purchase to uh to consume the hundred and ten thousand dollars so any i've got a question but I'll, I'll defer to jim or to don if they have questions I, I don't have any. So for, uh, we've also approved the Chromebooks. Would those not also be uh, collectible under the $117,000? Wouldn't that also be available to us? To we may actually allocate the full 117000 to the Chromebooks because of the way that the grant money works out. We're just saying if there's a total pot of money and we can decrease the amount of money that we're going to spend on, on these teacher computers, we really... I, I, Sincerely, I mean, look at the numbers in the Gordon. Can you talk about the age of the computers and how many? If you were to just make a, a general, I just want to make sure I have my facts right, Jamie. I don't want to, I'm not the tech director, and, and this is Gordon's cup of tea. But my understanding was that there are a significant number of computers that need to be replaced. Gordon, can you talk about that and the data that supports it? Sure. So, um, I got some, uh, some numbers from Diana in HR today about facilities that, um, would be using laptops. And the total number that I've got um, is roughly about 206 um, employees that, uh, that use laptops. So looking at um, our numbers, we have three particular models that, that we have a lot within the district. The 5430, um, we have about 45 in play, and those were, were released in 2013. Um, the 5440s, which we have about 250 of them, uh, released in 2014. And the 5450s, which we have about 175 of them, which were released in 2015. Now, with these numbers, these also do include the, um, the carts which my guess were prior to um, one to one Chromebooks. So these carts were used for students within classrooms. So these numbers, um, you know, are, are really high compared to what our actual needs are because we don't need those carts anymore. Um, right now, I believe just paras use laptops in those carts and the goal is to eventually get a Chromebook in every para's hand um, as well. So we're looking at about roughly 200, if to play it safe, I would say about 220 devices that gives us room for any new hires or anybody that we may have missed um, in the initial count. So Gordon, if we if we use the CARES money of 117,000, how many devices could you buy toward that 200? I just don't, I haven't done the math. 
So assuming that the four year pro support is the yep. same price for the cheaper laptop. Yeah. Um, we're looking at nine ten minus two seventy nine. So that brings us to six hundred and thirty one dollars a laptop. Jamie, just so, so you know, I set a goal for Gordon of six hundred. When I when I talked to him after our last meeting, I set a goal for Gordon of six hundred dollars. And so we wanted to bring it to you to show you what it would take to get to six hundred and Coming in at 631 isn't bad. I was thinking he'd probably come in at seven and a quarter. I mean, just yeah. for clarification, when you say release, that doesn't mean when we purchased it. That just means when they brought it to the market. Is that a correct statement or not? I'm sorry, what was that? So when you gave your, your stats of 45, 250, and 175 on the 5430, 5440, and 5450 models that we have, you said release mm -hmm. dates were 213, 214, and 217. When you say release 215. Dates, 215. Sorry. When I, I just read it wrong. When you say release dates, do you mean that's when the model was released by Dell, or do you mean that's when we purchased it and released it to the teachers? So that's the, the release date of Dell. So you can you can go, you know, every year there there's new models put out by them. So you I don't know when these were actually purchased if they were at the start of Dell's release or towards the end of Dell's release. So they could be give or take a year for each one. So the uh, the 5450s could have been 2016 at some point. So at, at those numbers, I'm seeing 295 that are between the six and seven year old number. Uh, your, your thumbnail last time was 290, so about the same number. But you mentioned this time 220. What's what's the difference between those two numbers? For, for which one? So I'm looking at, if I take 5430 and 5440, those are the six to seven year items. You said if you really mm -hmm. covered everybody, you got about 220 devices you'd like to get, right? And so, Somehow you're not covering 75 of that 295, and I'm trying to understand what that is. I can answer that. Yep. Can I help, Gordon? Yep, sure. sure. There are laptop carts in the schools that had laptops in them, not Chromebooks. And that's where those devices came from. And so- Okay, that I, I, okay, I, I didn't understand that, that piece of what he said. Okay, so I got that now. So another way of restating that is that 75 of these laptops would be eventually replaced by Chromebooks. Or not at all. We need or not at all. Yep. To go pre -K Correct. They need labs. Correct. Since since everything's kind of gone one to one with the Chromebooks, those laptops, you know, the use have gone down and down over time um, because everybody pretty much has a Chromebook um, from third grade, right? Third grade, Tom. Third yeah. Grade on. What the what the real message is is this: we don't know yet. That's Gordon's work for this year is to work with the staff and work with Patty, Dr. Haynes, myself and Matt and parents and figure out what is the vision for technology in terms of student use in Sanborn Regional School District. I asked Gordon to talk about two things tonight because they're definites. One is that we, we have the seventh and eighth graders coming up to the high school and we'd like to get devices into seventh, eighth and ninth grades hands so that they will use those until the end of their senior year. We're hoping that their Chromebooks will hold out from seventh to 12th grade. Um, it's a long run, but we feel like seventh graders use their laptops a lot. So we, we probably should do that. Um, and then we do need to get on a rotation where every three years, a third of the staff are getting new devices. The problem is that we're way off the rotation below seventh grade we're thinking that Chromebooks would probably work for grades three through six, and then having some kind of a lab in the classroom or iPads for grades pre-K to two. And that's a philosophical conversation that needs to be had in the future. But just from a philosophical perspective, my perspective is uh, that kids need to be writing by hand, doing math calculations by hand, and reading for real every single day in paper books from grades pre-K to two. That is really important to me personally. So it's going to be a hard sell to tell me otherwise. So I think that that, that doesn't mean that they can't have an iPads in the classroom for practicing skills, but it's a bigger conversation. So what what Jamie what Jamie's asking is why is there a difference? And the reason why is that classrooms have computers and labs right now, and we're thinking about scaling that back. So 
uh, just some comments uh, on Tom's comment. I would not be supportive of, of uh, IPAT in K through three. I completely agree that the, the whole function of writing and the motion, the connection of, of information to brain synopsis requires that you're doing that and you're not hitting keystrokes all darn day. I agree. Yep. yep. Uh, I, and, and so I, I would not be supportive of that. Uh, generally speaking, I, I don't, it, it, what we're saying here is different than I anticipated from, from uh, coming in. I was thinking in terms of, okay, then, then we're not going to be at the 110,000 level. Or so where we were, we're going to be more into the 63,000 level. Yep. Um, I, I do concur that six and seven year old boxes are not um, overly functional anymore. Um, so something has to be done with that. Uh, I'm not sure I subscribe to, we need new boxes every three years. Um, so that's a, a discussion for a future point from whatever Gordon comes up with, with his uh, proposal. Um, so I just wanted to make those points and then again, reach out to Jim or Don with any other, uh, let discussions me, on this. Let, let me just respond to one thing, Gene. Okay, go ahead, Tom. When I said that having uh, iPads in pre-K two, and this is a bigger discussion for later, but I'll say it quickly. That would only be used for the purpose of, there are certain apps on iPads that are really good for um, sight word acquisition, math hack practice, and a couple of other things. And that's all they would be used for. Kids should be, I agree with you completely, kids should be writing by hand neurologically. No, no, no pushback at all. But that doesn't mean that there, there aren't some really great effective iPad apps. I don't want people using those to replace instruction. So we'll talk agree. about that more later. I just wanted yeah. to clarify so that people didn't, I don't want anyone going around saying, Mr. Ambrose thinks little kids should be on iPads. I don't think that at all. I think 30 <laughs> minutes a day max. Okay. Uh, Jim? Yeah. Um... 220 laptops at 631, I get $138,920. So uh, if you've got 117 from the CARE Act, that's 20 more and more, 21,000 more on top of the 63,000 or how do, how do those relate? Matt, can you go over the numbers for that? Because Jim, we're not, we're not asking for any more money than the CARES Act. We're saying we'll buy what the CARES Act will pay for. Okay. And we'll look at the rest next year. We All recognize right. that we can't do 220 today. Okay. That's enough for me. Thank you. Yep. What we really need to do is spend some time and buy um, and start getting into a rotation where we're rotating out um, like four-year-old laptops. Okay. Yeah. And so that we're not getting stuck into the situation where a teacher is having a seven-year-old laptop that doesn't have uh a camera on it that they can't use for um online learning and that's the situation we we faced here okay don any comments i mean it makes sense um and i think i figured out if they are around 631 dollars each we can buy about 185 computers um laptops instead of chromebooks um so that i mean it sounds good to me. I mean, that's the majority of them. Um, and I concur with what both uh, Jamie and Tom said with the whole not having kids, you know, totally different conversation for later, but not having kids, you know, pre-K to up to, you know, set through second grade on devices all the time. They need, they really need that paper and the, the black and white book in front of them. So, right, so yeah. I'll, I'll, um, I'll make one last comment and then I'll, I'll ask for a, uh, a motion to recommend. And that would be, I would, under normal circumstances, I would not be supportive of, of doing a whole 185 at one point in time, because then you're just building yourself a problem for your future rotations. So right. I would not normally do that. Given the uncertainty about what's going on uh, with COVID-19, given the uncertainty of the source of supply, which I bang my head on daily at work still uh, continually. Uh, I, I think in this one circumstance, that makes sense. And I think that Gordon, for your purposes, you should keep in mind that when it comes time to do a rotation, you can't have a rotation of 220. So part of that assessment I would think would include who are the power users that are truly stressing a box and need to be upgraded at X point in the future. And who are those that are using for lack of a better phraseology, more like a calculator that isn't really stressing it and don't really need that upgrade. And then we with a 
a sectioning of the population to a standard procedure. So I, I just wanted to get that out there. Um, before, you, before you do a motion, can I just say that it is important to recognize that the CARES Act money is coming, but it's it, the stipulations on how it gets used are a little bit unclear. We're working through that right now. So could you please make a motion to, to approve the computers using using the CARES Act money to either pay for the adult computers or the student computers, but the full amount needs to be applied to the purchase of computers because we may need to, to finesse the way that the funds are used based on the federal requirements. And I don't want Matt to be in a bind next week or the week after when he's filling out the paperwork. So the point is, is that we've got to buy computers for grades seven, eight, and nine. And then Matt has to take care of these adult computers. I just don't want to bind him by the motion tonight. Matt, did I say that right? I'm kind of speaking for you. Yeah, so it's just going to be broad authority. And what we do is we're going to try to make it fit within the federal grant and no further. So do we have a dollar amount that we're approving? It, do, do we need to approve it tonight? If this is going yeah. to be dependent upon future information, can it wait till the next school board meeting? Well, no, we've got to order the computers. So what we need your permission to do is to tonight is to order these computers. The funding mechanism we can talk about later because it doesn't, the money's the same either way. The 117,000 from the CARES Act can be applied to either the student computers or the adult computers. And then our local budget money can cover the difference in a couple of different scenarios. 50-50, all of it goes to the adult computers, all of it goes to the student computers. It, it, it really, it doesn't matter so much. The, the, the bottom line is that the money is going to the technology one way or the other. And I, Matt, do you have, can you clarify that at all? I don't feel like I've done the best job I could do. It's hard to explain. Um, I think you did fine. Okay. So then, then let's um let's get a quick motion because we're going to run out of time here. We've got three minutes left. So this is above and beyond what's currently in the technology budget. It's federal dollars. Yeah, it's extra money that we got for the CARES Act because of COVID-19. And we want to apply it to technology because we're probably, I don't want to say that we need it in the fall because we don't know yet. As Jamie said, it's very uncertain. When does the bill have to be paid? Good question. Uh, usually something like this, the bill would be paid when the items are delivered. So could we allocate the funds when they're delivered? No, you have to encumber it before June 30th, right? Well, the, the, okay. So if it's going to be coming out of this year's budget, I'd have to encumber it now. Okay. Right. The student devices are in this year's budget, right? They're, they're already, or is that next year's budget, Matt? Um, we can either do it out of surplus funds for this year or or throw it for next year, okay? Um, uh, I know that in the uh, uh, next year's budget, there's appropriation set aside for new equipment purchases um, for, for the uh, um, technology, okay? But for the federal grant, the uh, option is ongoing, so it, the, the timing isn't really as critical. The, the problem is, is that the CARES grant is opening up I'm hopefully today or tomorrow, and I'm going to start putting in the information. It'd just be great to have the authorization to be able to max that out and then take that off to the state. Well, so, we've already tapped the facilities fund for quite a bit yeah. from for through this fiscal year. If if the and we've already and we're taking forty thousand out for Chromebooks, is that correct? Um, actually, I just remembered for the Chromebook, what that was was a budget adjustment. Um, that I asked at the last finance committee meeting. And um, there was a, um, a line item that was created as part of the default budget like two years ago. And it just says like new line item and it says $75,000. And that was for equipment purchases. And so all I did for the Chromebooks is just ask for a line item transfer from one to another and just use what we currently have. Okay, so my preference seeing as how these are going to be distributed in September would be to take it out of next year's money. I'm fine with that. And, and I'm okay I, with that too. I think that, that the, the, the more that we can work is, and by the way, I moved the next meeting to five o'clock. So we're good for five more minutes. Oh, great. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I meant to tell you earlier. Um, so, so I, I, I think that the key to this whole thing is, in the greater context of our district and what we're trying to do, 
we whatever we can do to get our the tax rates as close to zero for next year on the school side as we can we need to do right and so i i know that it's kind of a non in some ways it's a, a little bit of an unusual thing for a superintendent to say take it out of next year's budget when we have a surplus this year but i'm thinking about the, the biennium budget and the overall tax impact of covid and i'm thinking about the second tax bill of next year yep i am aware that we have got to help people for that so i would support taking it out of next year's budget and uh, recognizing that we need to to do whatever we can to help our taxpayers out for the next year. I'm supportive of that. If, if I see Dawn uh, nodding her head. Uh, could I get a motion to that effect then? Well, the motion would be to approve the purchase out of next year's budget, right? Yeah, there's two. Uh, to, to, to recommend to the school board that we recommend the purchase the of 185 units. Um, at six hundred and thirty-one dollars a unit, uh, the next year's budget. So no, nope, that, oh. that that actually isn't the motion. It's close though. There's two funding sources. One is next year's budget, and one is the CARES Act. So the first motion would be to uh, recommend to the school board that the district purchase whatever number you just said, Jamie, of computers at X amount of money. The second motion would be to purchase laptops for seventh, eighth, uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade for next school year, that's the second motion. And then the third motion is to apply the money of the CARES Act and the money from next year's school budget to cover the cost of those two items. And when you're talking about the seventh and eighth grade, you're talking about Chromebooks. Those are Chromebooks, yes. Did I say laptops? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. I was gonna ask that too. <laughs> Chromebooks, thank you, I get, yeah. They okay, get so moved. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and how that works. Okay, second. All right. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, okay, let's do a roll call vote. Don? Yes. Jim? Yes. Uh, myself? Aye. So a uh, unanimous roll. So call. somebody's going to have to go through, watch this video, and write out the motion. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it usually goes. Yeah. Um, Okay, so we, we have the time. So the next item was unpaid lunch balances, and Matt sent some information out on that. Matt, could you chat about that for a, a yeah. moment? Yeah, I'll try to be quick on this one. Um, so paid lunch balances as of June 2nd um, was $13,966. Um, it, it, this is going to really focus on the senior class. The senior class, um, the unpaid balance is uh, $2,975. Um, what I'm going to ask is for a, an authorization to write off up to $2,975 from the uh, school board. Now, um, we're not going to actually write off that full amount because we're actually collecting funds from uh, parents right now uh, so that their students can graduate. Okay, so it's actually going to be a lower amount. And then also we have another item that's going to be going before the school board, which is going to help offset this in the future. And we're going to be asking to set up a trust fund where people can make donations into the fund to help um, cover the costs of people who just can't pay for uh, their school lunch. Now, is that is that just for the seniors, Matt? I thought we were just asking for them to forgive the seniors. Yeah, this the two thousand nine hundred seventy five dollars is just. OK, thirteen thousand nine sixty six is for all of it. I think, I think there's a critical update that's missing because Brian collected a bunch of money. I think it's way lower than that. It is way lower than that. But the problem is, is the systems aren't up to date. And so I can't give an actual number because it hasn't been keyed in yet. Oh, this, oh, oh, this oh. could actually be done at the next meeting then when we have... Not really, because they graduate oh, the fifth. You got to do it before Friday. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. it, it, so I, I think the reality becomes so what I saw from Brian. Brian has collected a lot of this already, and he has said basically, I won't get into the number of families, but he said there is a a number of families who, in his assessment, are under dire circumstances, and um, there is no ability to pay on the remaining balance. And if, frankly, in the year that we've just had, I would. I would be supportive of uh, not putting those people in, in a bad way for graduation. Jim? So this is basically a consent item. I mean, we don't need a motion on this. You're going to bring this to the school board, right? That's right. Okay. I just wanted to acknowledge that Brian done a, did a phenomenal 
phenomenal job uh, collecting money. He had, I think he's got it down into the hundreds. I think he's anticipating needing about six to $800 total. But I understand what Matt's saying. He has to ask the board to authorize the amount that's on the books in lieu of the actual submission and tracking of the funds that Brian has received because Brian worked really hard on it on Monday and it's Wednesday today. Yeah. So, so we're, maybe, maybe on the board, we make the motion to be net of any collectibles uh, up to this point in time. That would be great. Thank you. It's just for the scene and just for the seniors. Gene. Just for the seniors. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. Um, the next item that I had, and I, we don't need to belabor this long with one reason we don't have time to belabor it long, but I want to think about it is uh, goals for the finance committee. Um, and so some of the ones that I've been thinking of, I mean, Tom and I had some long discussions as to what should or shouldn't be in them that I've, I've given some consideration to. Uh, but I do still stick with a, a, a few, not that um, we're off, we're off, not that Tom and I are, are, are disconnected on it. Um, but really what we want to be doing from a uh, finance committee meeting is auditing the budget for areas of improvement and savings. And so two of the areas that I would like to include for specifics for food for thought uh, for the next meeting would be uh, we have um, new management in the athletics. We have new management in the IT area. Uh, we have a special education area, three areas that there's a lot of money spent. And it would seem to me to make sense to just take a look at those kind of um, audit processes, audit expenditures and, and determine is there um is there programs in place? Uh, is there anything different or helpful that could could be done or could be focused on? So, just some thoughts. I don't I don't need um, really a lot of debate on it. What I would like to know is Jim and Don if you had uh, additional thoughts as to things for us to consider over the next week. I uh, I other than year the year end balances, I don't. I think we should do an update on all the projects and the, the balances for those projects. So yeah, that would be the same thing, right, Jim? The year-end balance is really right. from now until the end of June. So we, we've got to wrap that up by the second meeting in June, which is two weeks away. So it's we're down to crunch time on that. Right. Yeah. It's going well, so. Yeah. Okay, Don, any comments? Oh, I mean, it sounds like a really peacemaker. I'm still, I'm still learning as I go, so yep. I'm going to follow your lead on this, but those sound like really important areas to focus on, so I think that's important. Okay. Um, so a couple, couple more left, only a few more minutes. The status of the 20000 initial payment on the sale of the seminary? Okay. So um, so under the purchase and sale agreement on item number two, um, basically, uh, uh, the purchaser has to spend, I'm sorry, the purchaser has to pay $100 into escrow held by the uh, the district's council. And that is in process right now. The second item, which is $19,900, is to be closing. Um, uh, that has no, that, the timing for that has not occurred yet. That, that would be uh, by July okay. next year. Okay, so right now we are in compliance, as far as I can tell. But by um, this time uh, next month, I'll be able to confer with uh, our attorney to make sure that the uh, that the money is held in escrow at their office. Jim. So, the original purchase and sale. My recollection is that the twenty thousand was payable when that was signed by both parties. I was not on the final. Right. You no, know, it was supposed to be at closing, Jim. That's the first payment of of the, and then the other one hundred and eighty comes at the end of the the purchase at the end of the period or whatever. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Matt. Tell me if I'm wrong. I'm 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 speaking from memory right now, and I forgot we're on on the record here in the video. Uh, my memory is both actually. My my my, my memory is yeah, originally one time was money up front. And yep. then they wanted us to indemnify in, in, in some different areas. And we said, well, you know, that doesn't make any sense. And it ended up, okay, then this much to have consideration for a legal contract. But then the other the other piece goes to closing. And I think that was in the final. Yeah, we can, if you would like to see the, the final version again, we can get that for you. I think I have it on my computer. 
Yeah, just let us know. We'll send it right out. Let Matt know. He'll send okay. it right out to you. Okay. And for the public's benefit, the uh, purchase and sale agreement's on the main page of the district. Oh, it is. That's right. Yeah. And I'm looking at it from the main page. Yeah, from the website. From the website. I did ask you to put that in the SLC lease right on there for public consumption. So that change was part of the negotiation? Uh, yes. Yeah. And, and it was around some of the points that were made about... Um, uh, indemnification for lack right. of, that's not how it's framed, but that's how I thought about it. Yeah, it's and coming I'm back to me now. I just want to make sure I'm saying yes, I believe so. It has been four months. I can't, or three yeah. months. it feels like a million years ago right now. It does. So, whatever's in that document is where it came out. Okay. And then the, the last item was there was, and, and Jim, I'll defer to you on this uh, the 146465 on uh, status of tuition. So that was which tuition were you referring to? Well, that's in the revenue report, and I think we we are Matt was already resolved. It. Matt Scott, go ahead, Matt. Matt. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Okay, so in the prior months, um, it said one hundred ninety-four thousand of uncollected tuition amount, and when we dug into it, we found out that there was a mistake made in allocating the budget between tuition and the uh, adequate ed, and that has been fixed for this month report. Okay, so then we're all set with that. Yes. Any, now, um, go ahead. Now it's a plus number. 42,000, is that right? Yes, now it's a plus number. Okay. Any other comments before we wrap up so uh, the Paul uh, guys can get started? Good. I'll okay. Uh, thank you all. We are hereby adjourned.